Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's so great to see so many of you here in the room and so many of you online. Uh, welcome all uh, for this very special uh, Dean's Lecture. Um, before I introduce our speaker for today, I always like to recognize what brings us here um, today. The Dean's Lecture series was first established to highlight the work of our newly appointed and promoted uh, professors here at the Bloomberg School. But today is a very special event as it marks the first time a senior scientist will give a Dean's Lecture. And moving forward, well, yes. <laughs> And moving forward, we'll have the opportunity to hear from more of our senior science, newly um, uh, appointed and promoted senior scientists. It is my great pleasure today to introduce Dr. Melissa Davy Rothwell, a renowned health educator and leading voice in behavioral science. Since coming to the Bloomberg School for her PhD, Dr. Davy Rothwell, Melissa, has studied how evidence-based interventions can be effectively implemented in community-based settings. In her research and practice, she examines and harnesses the power of peer education and social networks to help vulnerable populations. She has examined programs that help people who use drugs educate one another about risk and care behaviors. She has studied factors that can affect the uh, prevention medication among men who have sex with men. And she recently helped evaluate a new housing program for transgender women, uh, trans women in uh, Los Angeles. Through all of this work and more, she is creating close ties to our community and advancing knowledge that makes an impact in Baltimore, but way beyond Baltimore. Melissa has her primary affiliation in the Department of Health, Behavior, and Society, and was recently named its Vice Chair for Pedagogy and Academic Affairs. This new position recognizes her longstanding commitment to the educational programs, both in the department, but also the school. Melissa has advised countless numbers of master's and doctoral students, and since 2016, she has served as co-director of the Implementation Science Concentration of the school-wide DRPH program and also sits on the DRPH Executive Committee. She also co-leads a course in implementation research and practice. For many years, and we'll hear more about this um, this afternoon, Melissa has worked at the Lighthouse the department's community-based research center that focuses on health promotion and disease prevention, especially among the disadvantaged urban populations. She has been instrumental in helping the Lighthouse work toward its goals of both improving health, but also empowering the local community. She is also affiliated with the Bloomberg American Health Initiative, the Center for Adolescent Health, the Center for AIDS Research, SOURCE, and the Center for Innovative Care in Aging, uh, at the School of Nursing. As you can see, she's a very busy lady. Um, she has received funding and awards from NIH and the National Institute on Drug Abuse, as well as our own Department of Health Policy and Management. Now, Melissa may have earned her PhD from the Bloomberg School and her MPH from Emory University, but technically her public health work started much, much earlier than that. Back in the 1990s, she was a, an HIV peer educator at her all-girls high school, and as an undergrad, she took part in a program that taught local elementary school students about healthy eating. In other words, she has always been drawn to the power of, pub, of, of health education and the power of public health. And when she first considered coming to the Bloomberg School, it was the work of the Lighthouse that really caught her attention. Yes, it was a research center, but she loved that it worked, that it, its work was all about people, not just the numbers. As Melissa can tell you, and I suspect she will tell us, people come to the Lighthouse to take part in studies, but their relationships with the center and its faculty and staff go much deeper. When Lighthouse participants come through the door, they're often, often looking for a cup of coffee. Some days they may be looking for medications or, or condoms or help with uh, an eviction. At the Lighthouse, she and her colleagues are always ready to meet those who come to them in need. Every day they are showing us that of showing us public health in real action. Melissa has dedicated her, her career to unraveling the complexities of human behavior. 
understanding the nuances of social group dynamics, and addressing the challenges that come with putting effective interventions in place. She is making a vital impact on our understanding of behavioral science, and she is helping members of vulnerable populations live longer and healthier lives. Dr. David Rothwell, welcome. We are honored to have you and your family with us here today. Melissa. All right, well, um, I'm delighted to be here. Um, first, I want to thank you, um, Dean McKenzie, for having me here, but also for having senior scientists participate in the series. I think you're going to see we do a lot of cool stuff, and so I'm really excited to see um, other future senior scientists here, too. Um, so my training from master's to PhD was in behavioral science and health education. And that's really unconsciously how I um, put together my lecture today. First, I'm gonna talk about some of the social science work I do, and then I'll get more into that, you know, um, health education work that I do. I'm a little nervous, so sometimes when that happens, I talk fast. I'm from Philadelphia, so it happens. Um, but hopefully you'll understand me. <laughs> I may have to do this. There you go. Got it. All right. So, um, Dean Clegg, uh, Dean Clegg, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Dean, McK Dean McKenzie, um, already mentioned a bit about the lighthouse and I really appreciate that, but I really want to say that the lighthouse is why I came to Hopkins. It's why I stayed at Hopkins. Um, many people have heard me say, oh, I'm not staying at academia. I'm, you know, maybe two years, maybe, maybe five. Um, in fact, at my dissertation defense, um, Rajiv Vermal, who's now my chair, was one of my committee members, and he asked me if I was going to be in academia, and I was like, oh, no, academia is not for me. And the reason why I've been able to be here is because of the lighthouse. It really is applied work. It's really hands-on. Um, I wish we had more updated photos, but thanks to COVID, we don't. But the team is just amazing. It's a team where you're either an intervention facilitator, you're collecting data, you might be uh, providing resources, and we all are all hands on deck. So it's really the place where um, I think really grounds me being here at a place like Hopkins, because I'm. it might be my turn to clean out the fridge this week, or it might be my turn to give an HIV test. And so the heart of my career at Hopkins has been at the lighthouse. So as Dean McKenzie said, um, you know, I have been doing public health for a while, even before I realized what public health was. Um, she said I was a HIV peer educator. And then when I went to undergrad, I planned to be pre-med. So I was a biochem major. And what was really eye-opening for me is I took a course in urban health. And this is where I learned everything about substance abuse, HIV, um, mental health, poverty, and just other issues facing neighborhoods um, in urban settings that really opened my doors. And then I worked at an elementary school where I did service learning. That was my first exposure to service learning, um, where I taught elementary school kids about healthy eating. And this really, you know, solidified my interest in public health. So I knew by my sophomore year that I wanted to get an MPH. I knew I wanted to be in public health. I didn't know quite yet what but I had that interest. And then in my master's program, um, I was a health science educator, which meant that I went into elementary schools and once a week I took over their science class. So instead of learning you know, about their science curriculum, I would come in and talk about smoking and what smoking does to your body. Or I would come in and talk about you know, the importance of talking, you know, having good friends and talking to family. I think the the biggest, biggest formative experience was when I was in my age program, I really wanted to work at the CDC. Because to me, I thought the CDC was like the epitome of public health. I, I think it still is, but I think what we do here is really important too. Um, and when I was you know, applying to jobs, the CDC, I applied to many jobs in the HIV division, and I really wanted to work in adolescent health. 
Uh, <clears throat> but the only job I got offered was a job in HIV and substance abuse. And I was so bummed. I knew little about substance abuse. I really, this was not a population I wanted to work with. Uh, but lo and behold, this changed my career. And ever since, you know, having that CDC position, what's my work been in? It's been in substance abuse. So before I get into my research and practice, I did want to just take a pause um, to emphasize the philosophy behind my work and many of um, the work behind the lighthouse harm reduction. I'm sure, I'm sure many of you have heard it in the room, maybe not everybody on Zoom, but harm reduction is a philosophy of we are hoping to work with people who use drugs or, vulnerable, or other vulnerable populations to make one small step in their behavior, to lower the likelihood of getting consequences such as HIV or hepatitis C or overdose. So what this means is, you know, many times, you know, I've talked to people and they hear I work with people who use drugs and they ask, are you trying to get them off of drugs? I say no, unless, unless they're there. And to get there means uh, many, many, many steps in between. What I'm trying to do and what we're trying to do with the lighthouse is say, okay, what can we do to make someone a little safer? And what that might mean, it might, might, might mean that we encourage people to have fewer sex partners. We in, um, encourage people to get new needles before they inject. And so it's, again, healthy living um, so that they, um, we limit the consequences associated with drug use. So I am not a frameworks person. Uh, people at the Lighthouse, my little core group over here, um, helped me put together this framework. And this is gonna be the framework of my talk too. Um, so from now until my dissertation, I've been interested in social norms and perceived norms and how that impacts our behavior. I've also been interested in how do norms come about? Like where do we learn our norms and how do we pick up our norms? Then I get into interventions that we've done at the Lighthouse and I've been involved with, sometimes as a lead, sometimes as a co-lead, and how these interventions can change norms, which ultimately change behavior. And then the newish, newest line of my work, like in the past eight or so years, has been focused on translation and implementation of these interventions. All right, so norms. Chances are, when I say norms, most of you are thinking about social norms. Those norms that we all live by every day. You know, if you came here, um, you know, got in an elevator, there's a certain norm about how you stand in that elevator. There are certain norms about how I dressed for this talk today. I think some of you would be surprised if I wore my normal lighthouse, you know, gear, a t-shirt and jeans. But today I felt, you know, the norm was to dress up. I'm much more interested and perceived norms. And perceived norms are our perception about what other people are doing or what other people think is okay. So for example, um, with perceived norms, we have two different types of norms that we talk about. The first is descriptive norms, which are, what do I think everybody is doing? So in my social network, um, do I think people in my network are smoking? Do I think people in my network are um, using drugs, you know, and, and what frequency? Injunctive norms are those norms about what is shunned upon or accepted in a given um, set, in a given uh, group. And a main difference between these perceived norms and social norms is it's my perception. It doesn't mean it's right or not, but it's my perception because it's gonna change my behavior or influence my behavior. And it's typically tied to a reference group. And with that, I mean, we think about this behavior in reference to other people. I'm a mom. So sometimes I follow norms based off of what other moms, you know, associated with my kids' school do, you know, about participating in the PTA. Here we all follow certain norms about what it is to be a part of public health or what it is to be a faculty member or a student. Um, and so that's what I'm going to be talking about, this perception. Again, it, it doesn't necessarily mean it's right. It just means it's my perception. So before I get there, I just want to take a minute to, um, throughout the talk, I'm going to have a couple quotes from some of our real life 
Lighthouse participants. You can see what a difference the Lighthouse has made or the changes that um, they've made. So I will talk a little bit about drug injection. And drug injection is relevant because it's associated with HIV and hep C. Um, 10 percent, um, I go, let me, let me, let me, um, first bathroom run. <laughs> um, 10 percent of all new HIV cases go to people are among people who use drugs, as well as it's estimated more than 50 percent of people who use drugs have been in, infected with HIV at some point. And so at the Lighthouse, again, we're using this harm reduction philosophy to guide what we teach. So I just want to take a minute to put some of this in context. We use props at the Lighthouse. It works for us. Um, can everybody see my props? Okay. So I, sh I should say we also are now a syringe exchange program. We also provide um, Narcan which I'll talk about in a little bit to our participants, because we want to make sure that we're providing valuable resources. We're doing public health beyond the research setting. We're giving, doing public health for the community. But when we talk about drug injection, okay, there's many pieces to it. And I'm not going to open this because we could give this to one of our syringe clients, but you oftentimes will think about the syringe with the needle. But there's other pieces. There's a piece of cotton, or sometimes in the community, people might use a piece of a maxi pad or something that if somebody's going to inject, they use something like cotton that's a filter so that when they inject, um, no hard things, only the liquid part will go into them. There's also a cooker. And what this is, you know, on the street, you would probably see a bottle cap of some sort but most um, most drugs come either in pill form or powder form. And for somebody who wants to inject, they want to be able to take that and liquefy it. And so they put the drugs in a bottle cap or the cooker um, and add some water to mix it up so that them, the person and whoever they're using drugs with can then all share drugs. What are some of the issues with this? The issues are, we definitely don't want people to share needles because sharing needles is, you know, means um, HIV and hep C transition is going to be high. And fortunately, in public health, we've made a lot of advances. People who use drugs have gotten the message, don't share needles. We've, we've come a long way with that. And that's why, you know, in the 90s and early 2000s, HIV rates among people who use drugs were much higher than they are now. So we've made progress. What we're still working on is sharing this cooker. Some people think, well, I have my own needle. They have my own needle. That person has their own needle. We just share the cooker. The problem with this is the cooker can also um, be a vehicle for HIV and hep C transmission, as well as the cotton. So what we do at the Lighthouse, we want to provide safe options. We'll provide them a pack of new syringes. That means it's gonna decrease the likelihood of them sharing needles or, sh or syringes or having to use a dirty one. We give them clean cookers. Again, it's something they can use, keep for themselves or get rid of. Um, we give them clean water. And this is because it's more purified than say using other options that people on the street might use to when they use, um, use drugs. And then we give them cons. And so this, quote here is one of the other harm reduction options we teach our participants when using um, about using drugs and harm reduction. So the idea is instead of using this or both of the people using from this, there's one part of, um, you know, before we get to the injection, we talk about splitting drugs. And this is an approach where we say, instead of putting the drugs here and you know, everybody taking, you know, their share of the drugs from one cooker. Let's learn to split the drugs dry. So this is, and actually my colleague Karen Tobin came up with this thing and that actually worked. It's a laminated piece of um, graph paper that we've, you know, taught our clients to use and they really bought into it. 
because of the graph paper, it allows them to split drugs evenly. Because if you're using drugs, you know, equity is really important. Everybody wants to make share, make sure that they get an equal share. So instead of, um, you know, sharing a cooker, this is another approach. And as you can see, you know, it might seem a little out there, but for our clients who use drugs, it's another approach that works for them and it's harm reduction. Right now, my kids are like, really, what does mom do? <laughs> um, so I've been very fortunate to look at lots of um, behaviors that are impacted by norms. Um, I feel like this was like, everybody told me this was like the obligatory slide to include, but I wanted to just put something simpler up where I've looked at norms because I'm really fascinated by them. And the reason is norms don't always predict behavior. There are some circumstances where it doesn't. Um, for some behaviors, descriptive norms are more relevant than inductive. Um, some behaviors both. But I have you know, looked at um, norms in people who use drugs, heterosexual women, men who have sex with men, women with incarcerated partners. We looked at... Um, the sex behaviors of women with incarcerated partners um, about, you know, when their partner's incarcerated, you know, are they abstaining from sex? Are they having, um, are they using condoms? Are they having multiple partner, uh, multiple sex partners? And then people who smoke. And we found norms have, you know, been a consistently associated with the behaviors. So whether it was exchanging sex for money or drugs, which is a real behavior that many of our clients and other people who use drugs do. Cigarette smoking, having multiple sex partners, alcohol use, and drug injection. So that's a little bit of some of my older norms work. As the, um, I would say, as the focus on people who use drugs has shifted from HIV to hep C to more prominently now overdose. I feel like that's how my norms uh, work has gone. So this wor wor norms work has followed. So this is um, one of our quotes from one of our participants who we've taught them about overdose uh, risk reduction. So take a second to read it. <clears throat> well, as you're reading, I'll say, so, Overdose is a public health emergency. Last year, more than 100,000 people died of a fatal overdose. Using the harm reduction approach, we can reduce the number of fatal overdoses. You can also reduce overdoses, but it's more feasible, I would say, to reduce the number of fatal overdoses. And so what we do at the Lighthouse is, again, we're trying to meet our clients where they are. And so, we train them on how to uh, use Narcan. And we are a certified Narcan distributor now, which means you know we're recognized as a state as a place to get Narcan. And we give them a box of Narcan. And what Narcan is, it comes in, in a nasal spray or it comes in injectable. <clears throat> I would say most, most people prefer the nasal spray because it's scary to inject somebody, um, you know, or it's just it's just uncomfortable. But what happens with the nasal spray is if I'm with somebody and they overdose, then all I have to do, hopefully I take my nas my uh, Narcan out of my pocket or my bag, and I um, put it up someone's nostril and spray. And then I, if there's any more, I spray in another nostril. And the idea is this simple medication that you can get from the Lighthouse or many other places in Baltimore City can um, stop a fatal overdose. Now, many of you have probably heard of fentanyl. And fentanyl is um, a drug that, you know, historically was, um, was like a medication, but now more prominently it comes in all different shapes and forms and people can get it through many different types of, um, you know, avenues, especially here in Baltimore. And so what we found in Baltimore, sometimes one of these isn't enough. And so good thing is, and I don't want to open this because again, um, I don't want to waste it for our clients, 
but each box contains two of these. And so what we train our participants, we say, okay, um, use one of these. Within a minute or two, the person should start, you know, moving around. Um, for somebody who has never, you know, witnessed an overdose or doesn't know, usually you can tell when someone's overdosing. Their color changes, they usually get unconscious or, or they start getting very sluggish, they're not responding to their name. And when in doubt, we say give Narcan. Narcan can, can't hurt you. It's not something you can overdose on. So, you know, it's a good approach. And so with fentanyl, we say keep two handy. That way, if the first one doesn't work and they're not starting to move or not starting to get a little more conscious, use a second one. And more than likely, the second one um, will prevent that fatal overdose. And again, it's harm reduction. So I've had people say, well, that's not going to get someone to stop using drugs or overdosing in the future. That's true. But if more people carry Narcan, this little thing, you know, it comes, comes like this, two of them in their bag, it can prevent fatal overdose. And so another thing I should say is, uh, in addition to carrying Narcan and using Narcan, we always want to encourage people to call 911. Now think about it, if you're someone who uses drugs and you're with someone who overdoses, how scary would it be to call 911? In Maryland, there is a law called the Good Samaritan Law. And what this law means is if I am with somebody and they overdose, if I call 911 and stay with that person during, you know, until help gets there, I can't be charged with possession. I can't be charged with any, any crime because I'm being a Good Samaritan. So not many people in Baltimore know that, or I would say they're a little skeptical of the law. And so that's one of the things we're also trying to encourage our clients to call 911. We give them a card that tells them about the Good Samaritan card. We give them a card that they can pull out, you know, in the event a cop were to give them a hard time. So one of my more recent um, papers that this is um, in progress right now is we've looked at the norms about carrying naloxone or Narcan. And what this is, it's if I believe um, my um, friends who use drugs are carrying Narcan, at least some or all the time, just think about it. You know, in an ideal world, you would carry Narcan, Narcan all the time. We would carry Narcan all the time in case we saw somebody you know, outside or anywhere overdose. For people who use drugs, we want them to carry Narcan all the time so that in case they see somebody overdose or in case an opportunity arises for them to use drugs. So always is the goal. Right now we're in that like, you know, sometimes rarely stage. And so what we looked at, we looked at, um, if I believe my friends who use carry Narcan some or all the time, am I more likely to, to um, carry Narcan some or all the time? And what we found is, um, yeah, norms are highly, highly um, associated with carrying Narcan. So, but, you know, the simple thing of believing others like me are carrying Narcan influences my behavior to carry Narcan. Another harm reduction approach that we talk about is using drugs alone, not using drugs alone. So think about it. Somebody who uses drugs for many, many years, if not decades, they've heard about the dangers of HIV. They've heard about the dangers of Hep C. So what do many people do? They use drugs alone. That way they don't have to risk any opportunities of sharing you know, any of the things I just mentioned. A challenge with using drugs alone is what happens if you overdose and no one is there. So again, using that harm reduction approach, we encourage people to not use drugs alone, but we know some people are still gonna use drugs alone. <clears throat> Drug use has lots of stigma associated with it. Um, again, because of HIV hep C for, for many reasons, people will still use drugs alone. So what we do is we encourage them to call or text a family member or friend and let them know 
If, you know, say, you know what, call me back in five minutes. If I don't answer, you know, call 911. And we've heard from our clients, you know, people are actually using this technique where the idea is the client can use a loan sometimes in their bathroom and people are downstairs, sometimes in their house where no one's there, but they can use, um, use drugs in a setting where they feel comfortable, but someone's on alert to give them a call or text so that in the event they do go out, they can call 911. <laughs> so in this analysis, we looked at um, if, if we believe our friends who use drugs, use drugs alone, sometimes or all the time that they use drugs, um, how was that associated to me using drugs alone? And in this case, what we found is there was no association. So in this case, norms were not associated with the behavior. Um, and why is it? And if you have thoughts, let me know because we're starting to write the discussion. Um, but what we've heard is, and what we know is, sometimes norms are associated with behavior and sometimes they're not because of behaviors that are public or private. So for example, if I'm, you know, using drugs with other people, I might be able to see that people have Narcan with them in their bag or they carry it with them or they call 911. I might be able to model my behavior based off of what I see other people, you know, that I'm using drugs do. But if I'm using alone, I don't really have that comparison to see, to model other people's behavior. So this is just, you know, one explanation for why we think norms, um, didn't hold up. We actually found this when we were looking at HIV behaviors. We found injection behaviors such as, you know, injection, injection frequency and sharing needles and cookers were associated with norms, but then condom use wasn't. And so we thought again, because when we're talking about condom use, that's more of a private behavior. That's something that, you know, the two people, you know, having sex know what the other person's doing. So again, if you have any ideas, share them. You know, happy to include them in our discussion. <clears throat> so just um, just quickly, I also, you know, as we've been looking at norms, we've also just wondered again, how, are, how do norms come about? Like, you know, there's theories about, you know, there's, um, you know, just by modeling people's behaviors, we kind of put that bits of information in our brain and, and it tells us what to do in the future. But we wanted to test some associations to see, could we see what was associated with norms? So in this case, we're not looking at norms of behavior, we're looking at what and norms. And what we found is in an essence, where you live um, is associated with norm. And in this analysis, what we did is we looked at neighborhood disorder. A neighborhood disorder is a measure of, um, the amount of um, different things happening on your block or sometimes in your neighborhood. So it could be vacant housing, vandalism, um, people getting robbed or beat up. Things that, you know, we would typically associate with a disordered or a, a troubling neighborhood in a sense. And so what we found is our clients who lived in neighborhoods with higher disorder um, believe that the, the people, the people who use drugs, the people, excuse me, the people they use drugs with exchange sex for money or drugs and that they share needles. So this was saying, I live in a neighborhood with high disorder. So because of this disorder and because of maybe what I've seen or what I've heard, I think the peop other people that I use with share needles and exchange sex for money or drugs. Again, it doesn't mean it has to be right. It's just perception. Another thing we looked at is, you know, when you go into like the um, psychology literature and about all norms development and social comparison, communication is all always there. And sometimes it's, you know, actual communication. Sometimes it's, you know, body language. So, so we put it to the test. And this is one of our older papers, but I thought it was relevant to share where we looked at communicating about these topics, about HIV, cleaning meals, Bottom use. We put it all together in a scale. So we combined all the variables into like a HIV communication scale was associated with believing 
that people that I use drugs with used a new cooker, a needle, and share needles. So again, it's just some, some ideas to get you thinking about how do our norms come about? Like, you know, um, you know, what are those things that influence our norms? And knowing that is important because then if we're trying to change norms and ultimately change behavior, we could figure out are there opportunities in that like proximal, you know, component um, to change factors in that, that prox proximal domain. All right, so I've gone through the behavioral science component um, and I've talked your ear off about norms. And so now I'm gonna give you a snapshot of one of the interventions we do at the Lighthouse. Um, I've been fortunate at the Lighthouse to be involved in several interventions for men who have sex with men, heterosexual women, uh, people living with HIV, people who use drugs, people inject drugs, and now currently a project for um, older adults living with depression. And one of the approaches we use, which I really have bought into, um, is an approach called a peer education model. And the idea is if I get trained in how to do something or you know, get information, resources, if I share this information with you, people in my social network, you and I might change our behaviors. So one of our interventions that we have going on now is called Be Safe. And it's a social network-based intervention that is focused on overdose response and prevention. And it's a, right now in a clinical uh, trial stage. So in this intervention, we train people who use opioids, fentanyl, heroin, to be peer mentors who then conduct um, peer outreach to risk partners and people on their social network. <clears throat> so in this intervention, um, we started it as right before COVID. And so this was the goal of the intervention. It was an individual intervention. So um, one facilitator met with one participant. Um, because of COVID, we quickly realized our peer mentors were really on board. They wanted to keep, you know, talking to people on their social network, but COVID was in everybody's face. Think about this in, in 2020. And so this intervention quickly became an overdose and COVID um, intervention because we realized in order for our peer mentors to talk about overdose, COVID was the way to get through to them. So at least let's start talking about what's happening in the world, everything about COVID. Um, and so the new goals are to improve peer mentor communication skills for peer outreach, and then increase self-efficacy and practice of safer overdose and COVID-19 behaviors. I've told you about some of our overdose behaviors, Narcan, calling 911. Um, there's a few others if you're interested. And then COVID, all the things we've all been doing, you know, for the past, what, 17 months. So the intervention is now four individual sessions. Interestingly enough, it's done over the phone. And we've never had an intervention done over the phone. Um, all of our interventions have been at the Lighthouse, which I should mention is a few blocks from the School of Public Health building. So it's a little more situated in the Baltimore community. Um, we've always done face-to-face -face interventions. And because of COVID, we had to explore options. And Zooms didn't work. Zoom did not work for our population. We had to do lots of feasibility testing and uh, needs assessment to see if phone sessions were feasible, and they were. And they've actually been um, done well. So we have four sessions, one on COVID-19 risk reduction, one on peer outreach and communication, overdose prevention, and overdose risk reduction. And in order to make this phone intervention work, we send them an intervention pack. And though, so we send them a manual that has every handout we would give them, and the facilitator on the phone has the exact same manual. We give them Narcan, we give them snacks, um, and masks, and gloves and hand sanitizer, because our clients really wanted um, gloves, so we, we included that. And then <clears throat> another overdose option that we talk about, these are called fentanyl test strips. And I forgot to bring one of those. Um, but a fentanyl test strip is really like a strip that could be used to test someone's urine to see if, if they've used fentanyl or any, any drug that has fentanyl in them. Um, 
that has been flipped as a tool for people who use drugs to use in their drug solution. <clears throat> so they take their cooker, they have the drugs and the water, other liquid, they put the fentanyl test strip in it to see if fentanyl is in their drugs. And the idea behind this is if fentanyl is in your drugs, you try different options. Maybe you go a little slower. You know, you try to use a little bit at a time. Maybe you really make sure you have Narcan handy or you make a plan for someone to call 911 if somebody goes out. So that's another option. Again, it may not work for everybody, but it's part of this home reduction philosophy. And yeah, so that's our packet. So that was a, a sneak peek of our intervention, but I did want to spend a decent amount of time talking about like the new newest line in my research, which is more focused on uh, translation and dissemination of interventions. <clears throat> so Karen Tobin and I um, were awarded a grant a few years ago where we work with the CDC. The CDC recognized this intervention and since then has recognized two other, um, two other Lighthouse interventions as evidence-based interventions. And what that meant is these interventions had um, significant evidence to show, um, show reductions in HIV risk behaviors. And so SHIELD was a six-session intervention for people who have a history of using drugs, and we've trained them to be peer educators. So unlike Be Safe, where the goal was focused on overdose, this one was focused on decreasing sex and drug behaviors associated with HIV. So we worked with the CDC to package this intervention so that they could then um, disseminate it through all different health departments and community-based organizations and other organizations that were interested in implementing this type of intervention. Through this process, um, we developed this package. We had a pilot test it with organizations. Um, you know, like, like I mentioned, SHIELD was done in Baltimore. It was a mix mixed sex or group, small group with people who used heroin and cocaine or had a history of using them. We had to pilot it and we ended up piloting it, piloting it with a drug treatment program because we wanted to see would this harm reduction intervention work or would participants be engaged in a drug treatment program as well as um, a program that was a transitional housing for incarcerated men who just got released. And through this process, as well as working with other organizations nationally and CDC and other trainers, we put together this whole package. But the idea behind these packages really is that if I'm, you know, in Indiana and I've recently had, you know, a surge in HIV cases, can I take this package and, impl and I can implement it exactly as laid out here? So it, it, there's a little bit of a leap of faith in saying, you know, do exactly as you're told, and you'll get the exact findings. Um, you know, what we always say is, do what you can and evaluate it, you know, to see, you know, what kind of results you get. And so this um, package, you know, was disseminated to over 35 organizations um, nationally. And honestly, I don't know, like, it's been, it's been a couple months, but like, it seems like every quarter we get two or three emails from people all over the world who want to implement SHIELD. And now it's been implemented with people who use crack, it's been implemented with youth who use drugs, it's been implemented with, um, you know, barber colleges. It's been really exciting to see where it's implemented. So I was curious to see how it would be implemented. So I received a KO1 from National Institute of Mental Health. And so what I did is I just did a, um, an implementation evaluation to understand, you know, what happens when SHIELD is implemented in these settings. Um, and so I looked at facilitators and barriers. Um, we contacted 34 organizations and we ended up with 18 who took part in the study. Six never, they got trained in, oh, and I, let me back up a second. So through this dissemination, the CDC provided regional trainings across the U.S. so that people could go and get trained on SHIELD and other evidence-based interventions um, 
that the CDC sponsored. And so we got a list from the CDC of organizations who had recently been trained in SHIELD, and we contacted them to see um, if they had implemented it and what facilitators and barriers had they experienced. And so we ended up with 18 organizations and 12 of them had fully implemented, implemented it. And so by this, they had completed the six sessions. <clears throat> and it's a bad slide, but I didn't want to give you, um, I wanted you to see the range of different settings and populations that this program designed for, you know, conducted in Baltimore was implemented in. Um, so like I said, we were really excited just to see the variety of organizations, types of organizations and populations. So in our evaluation, we use an implementation framework called Consolidated Framework for Implementation Research or CEPR. And there's a lot here. Um, but I want you to just focus on the things I have circled. In this case, implementing SHIELD, um, and at the top, so outer setting are things happening outside my organization. Inner, things happening in my organization. Individuals refers to the, the staff who deliver the intervention and the recipients or the client, and then the intervention itself. And sticking with the social network, um, theme of the, pro of the talk today, I wanted to you know, highlight that some of the facilitators were getting support from other partners in the community and the people that trained them. So when they implemented it, they weren't alone. There were continuously um, resources there that can help them along the way. Those that already had a presence in the community as an organization that was a safe place for people who use drugs, that tried different types of programs uh, were more successful. And then those who, um, I would say the first two are really big in the implementation science literature. The first one being staff buy-in. Whenever you wanna implement a new program, a new policy, one of the first things you should do is make sure the people who are gonna have to enforce it or implement it are on board. Do they have buy-in? And in this case, organization, that their staff were on board, they had buy-in, uh, were more successful at, at implementation, and then being a champion. So I'm sure many of us have, uh, <clears throat> sorry, many of us have you know known that person. I feel like sometimes I'm that person at the lighthouse that gets really excited for like a new program or really excited for something new to happen. You know, maybe we're bored with all the existing uh, existing programs or initiatives, we try something new. And the champion is that person who you know, tries to get other people on board, tries to get other people excited. And then there are current participants. So having other people who are in the program talk to other people in the community about their program was a big facilitator and led to successful implementation. And then finally, um, you know, getting the word out about a new program for those that their networks in the community were smaller, this was one of the barriers. All right, so now I'm gonna shift gears a little bit and I'm gonna take a sip of my water. Um, <clears throat> so I was fortunate to have a new collaboration over the past couple of years. And I think that's one of the awesome things about public health. You know. You start working with the population and over time, you just start building new collaborations and start working with new populations. And I think that's what keeps public health really exciting. And so um, the Bloomberg American Health Initiative supported me and a colleague in evaluating a program called Casa Zuma. And what Casa Zuma is, it's a short-term housing program for trans, trans women in LA. And it's a program, a house that people, women can go to for 90 days. And the initiative came about through an organization called APIT, which provides programming for LGBT population. So everything from you know, mental health programming, job placement, um, support groups, all of that. And the a housing authority, the homeless outreach um, program. So they came together, you know, the 
the people that want to house everybody and the group that wants to provide programming to provide a range of programming so that um, trans women could have stable housing for 90 days. And I wanted to, this, this is, I feel like I'm getting a little choked up because it's such an awesome program. Um, many of you in public health know trans women have high levels of addiction, high levels of violence, and we need to work with them more. We need to provide more collaboration so we can better serve this underserved population. So I just wanted to show a short video so you can get a taste for what Casa Luma is like. Um, um, and you can see a little bit about the difference it makes. So I'm gonna make sure this works for you. Mm -hmm. Today, we say to our trans community, as we have now for years, we see you, you are us and part of this city, and we will bring you home. Today is a momentous occasion for this great city of Los Angeles. We basically opened the first ever publicly funded enhanced bridge housing for transgender women, a very vulnerable population. Many of the shelters aren't always necessarily trans friendly. Many of them get attacked. Many of them are assaulted at these shelters. So a place like this would be more firming and safe. And we're just so grateful that we have a home now for our community. If they decide they want to find work or go back to school, this will allow and provide an opportunity for that to happen for them. I'm so proud to be here with people that I care about and I respect. I'm so happy for the 16 women who now have a home. And what a beautiful place that is, don't you think? All right, wait a minute. There we go. All right, we're back. Um, <clears throat> so, this is a new collaboration for me and you know, a new population I'm working with. So I'm constantly learning from the women and constantly just making sure that, you know, I'm using my harm reduction, you know, fiber that's built within me and working with this population. And, you know, I'm excited for the future that's gonna come with working with this population, but a really excited, unexpected benefit of is, um, and I won't say the name, but one of the people who's a part of Casa Zuma at APIT who was on the video is now a new DRPH student in implementation science concentration. So it just goes to show all your collaborations um, out there. Make sure you talk up our MPH and DRPH programs because it's an op uh, awesome opportunity for both of us. Um, <clears throat> but through the Bloomberg American Health Initiative, I received a grant where I did an evaluation of the program. I interviewed um, with my colleagues at the Lighthouse, uh, 24 staff and clients. I did document review of reviewing like their intake program, um, intake process, all the forms and all the programming they provide for their clients, and then a virtual site visit. Um, <clears throat> and this was done in like the summer of 2020, fall of 2020. So it was definitely uh, at a time where we weren't traveling to LA at that time. Um, so everything was done virtually. And despite, despite it being a virtual site visit, we got a lot of great information. And just some preliminary findings that kind of tap into that social network theme is, <clears throat> so while in theory, having this housing authority and um, LGBT program or programming organization coming together, they both had different goals. You know, one, wanted to have women housed and wanted to hopefully move them to more stable housing. Another one wanted to build, you know, wanted to help them get a job, help them achieve their family, their, their personal um, goals, work with their family. And so one of the things we found is it wasn't like a clear shared goal um, for some of the participants and staff. And you oftentimes hear programs being low barrier. And that means like, you know, especially in populations who use drugs, it means um, 
there's not many requirements to being in this program. You know, they don't set lots of barriers to you know, making sure somebody's clean, making sure somebody's drug free, making sure, you know, somebody has been stable. Um, so it's low barrier. And this program too was like that. And people got referred to a variety of ways. Sometimes it was self-referral. Sometimes it was from a shelter. Um, sometimes it was from uh, the criminal justice situation, uh, system. But there was a tension between being um, low barrier and having programming. So what this meant is for some women, it was a safe place to sleep and just catch up on you know, privacy, sleeping and being by themselves. For others, it was an opportunity to, you know, not worry about housing, but also, you know, get all this additional programming. And so that was, I think, one of the, the tensions both, both clients and staff shared because, you know, going back to that lack, lack of shared goals, you know, as the women were going through the program, some were coming out, you know, with, um, I should say, more resources than others because of what their goals are. And you can't blame them. Again, go in. To it back to this harm reduction, um, having a safe place to sleep can be really important. Having a safe place, you know, to just think is really important. And then finally, uh, this community of being around the community of other trans women, including some of the staff for trans women, was really important to the residents. Um, <clears throat> so just in conclusion, just some things to leave you with. Uh, changing norms is really important and a great strategy to ch change the behavior. As I said, peer education interventions are one approach. Uh, through these peer education interventions and through our own conversations, talking about topics like overdose, HIV, can help reduce some of the stigma associated with them. And then a plug for some of my work here and stuff is implementation of interventions depends on the experience of staff clients and other stakeholders. Um, just some brief acknowledgements. Um, first, I just wanted to dedicate this lecture to my parents who um, really taught us, my sister and I, about you know family, community, and hard work. My mom passed away a few years ago and my dad is on Zoom. He might be a person You've heard coughing every so often, um, but they both, they've just been so instrumental in getting me here where I am. <clears throat> I come from a large family. I'm Italian, I'm from Philadelphia. So I grew up in a neighborhood where aunts and uncles and grandparents were sure to walk away. Um, some of them are in the room, some of them are on Zoom, but they've all in their own way helped me. Um, my best friend, Jess, my aunt and my sister, my in-laws, my large family. But I especially want to point out the other three who are here, Adam, David, and Jenna. Uh, thank you for putting up with me when I get cranky about a grant, when I'm sad about something that might have happened at the lighthouse, or when I talk about things that make you uncomfortable. Um, and then I've been so fortunate here at Hopkins and at the lighthouse to just be surrounded by many people who have kept me in academia much longer than I thought I'd be. So thank you all. And any questions? Well, we do have um, some oh, it's told to come up here. <laughs> we do have some time for questions, so um, please uh, raise your hand in the audience. And if you, if those of you online um, have a question, uh, just raise your hand or type it to Becky, Becky uh, newcomer, yeah. Becky newcomer, um, and show, and we'll call on you. Okay, but we can start with the audience here. Any questions? I may have told them to not ask questions. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I think maybe your children have a lot of questions. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, well, maybe I can start start with one and just ask you, you know, with all the implementation uh, research that work that you have done, um, are there are there certain um, challenges that are common 
you know, across uh, uh, the implementation of interventions in the community setting that you can identify or what's the secret sauce? Are there a couple of things that if you don't get right, you're not, you don't have a, a prayer of may, having it work? Yeah. So, uh, so, so I always, um, when I'm talking about implementation science, I always say, you know, we tell you why a program worked or didn't work. And so the first thing you really want to do, and I think the most important you want to talk to the people who are going to be implementing the program and the people who are going to be receiving the program. Because you want to make sure everybody's on board. Um, you want to make sure that at an organization, if you're trying something, a new program, you want to make sure there's ample training. You want to make sure the frontline staff know what's expected of them and know what they're expected to do. Um, and you wanna make sure it's a program that is important to the population. In implementation science, we talk about acceptability and appropriateness. And so what that means is, is this program acceptable to the organization, including the staff, but also the people receiving the intervention? And then is it appropriate? I might love peer educator interventions, but if I go into a population that Talking to other people about substance abuse doesn't exist. That type of intervention is not going to work. Okay, start with that, and then Rajiv. Yeah. Uh, so that was really great to see, like the arc of your career and the pathway. I'm just wondering, you're like, looking back on it, like, are there things that you sort of had to like leave on the cutting room floor, or like wish you could go back to that were like interesting or inspirational that you just because you're so busy and doing so many different things. You would like to visit. That's an awesome question, Dill. <laughs> so, so, so one, no, no, no. One of one of the things that, um, and I call it my first first professional baby. When I was um, at the end of my doctoral program, I was a project coordinator of one of our interventions um, called Chat. And it was a program, and my husband's laughing because I think that's when I met him, when I was talking all about chat. Um, but it was a program for heterosexual women at risk for HIV, you know, to teach them about, you know, condom negotiation, partner skills to decrease the risk for HIV and STIs. And I was really interested in the population. I was really interested because I think women can be complicated, and not just because we are, but especially working in interventions because of different gender dynamics, power imbalance, um, gender norms. And so I think if I had the opportunity, I would have focused more of my work on women. And while women have been incorporated in um, the work I've done with people who use drugs, it's, it's been men and women. Good answer. Um, maybe I'll, I'll give David Helgrave a chance to jump the line, Rajiv, and then we'll come back to you. But it's great to see you, David. Um, and if you could unmute yourself and ask your question. That's great. Thank you very much, Dean McKenzie. And uh, congratulations, Melissa, not only on your amazing lecture, but uh, also uh, all of the work that you've done over the years, truly saving lives and building health equity. So congratulations, Melissa, sincerely. And I, I just wanted to ask a quick question about harm reduction. As you know, it's one of the central features of the new national drug control strategy and um, your use of fentanyl test strips is so uh, creative and important. And I, I wondered kind of what percentage of people who are using fentanyl test strips are starting to see them test positive. There seems to be so much fentanyl now in the supply that I'm wondering it is sort of the prior probability moving from fentanyl is rare to fentanyl is so common that you kind of assume that it may be there. And then my second part of the question was just, uh, are you starting to see other adulterants like xylazine and so on being folded in with um, fentanyl and other issues, which makes naloxone so much harder to use? So again, thanks uh, for letting me ask a question, uh, Melissa, and congrats again. Thank you, David. Good to see you. Um, I will say, especially in a city like Baltimore, you know, even when we talk about heroin, cocaine, chances are there's fentanyl in it. It's just so prevalent. Um, you know, when we when we talk about fentanyl strips, again, it's an option. That's not going to work for everybody. But one of the limitations of um, of fentanyl test strips is they only capture so many 
And what is it, Karen, 26? I'm looking at you. I think it's 26 different types of fentanyl, which are the most common, but there's other types of fentanyl out there. So there is a chance you would get a false negative, in which case, you know, the, the fentanyl test strip is saying there is no fentanyl, but there is. Um, it's not a tool that, you know, in that situation, when you think about, I have this cooker with drugs that are ready to go, that somebody's going to stop using, you know, chances are like not going to say, oh, no, I can't do that. It's got fentanyl in it. So that's why we say, OK, then other options you have are go slower, use a little bit to see how your body reacts, get your Narcan, stuff like that. Um, and as far as the other drugs, other colleagues in the room that I'm I mean, I they we started hearing about them. Um, but they're not as prevalent yet. Anybody in the, else in the room have you going to add with that one? I'll, I'll just say, Melissa, about 15% of uh, Maryland overdose decedents test positive for xylazine. It's hard to determine it as a cause of death, um, but it, it does look like it's really becoming an issue. This is why you need to have your social network filled with people smarter than you. Thank you so much, Renee. Uh, um, Melissa, first of all, congratulations. I think uh, I'm so glad that David is here as well, because clearly he was, you know, as my predecessor, as the uh, first chair of HBS, <laughs> I set the stage, I think, for the success of a lot of people in our department. Uh, and in your case, I mean, you started very early in HPS in, at Hopkins as a doctoral student uh, and came up through the scientist track uh, and now have you know, what a tremendous, what a great arc of success. And you're now also the vice chair of the, of the department. I'm wondering if um, when you put on that lens of uh, an assistant associate and senior scientist in your trajectory, what advice or thoughts you might have for others in that line, in that profession, who may not see this, the, the, the uh, uh, final sort of achievement uh, as being as reachable as, or as easily, as easily reachable as others in the tenant track, for example. Great question. Um, and for those who don't know, so I am a senior scientist. I'm not a professor. Senior scientist or other scientists are considered non-tenure track. So we still do a lot of cool work. We just are on a different, at a different pace than professors. And I think, and, and I feel like I've been asked this from other junior scientists. The first thing I'd say, own it. I've never been uncomfortable being a scientist. It works for me. It works for my family. It still allows me to do awesome research and practice. Um, I think over the past couple of years, even more than that, the school, has you know allowed scientists to get into leadership roles, um, and so I would say own it and don't be afraid to put your name in for for leadership op opportunities. The worst that can happen is they say no, but you know um, I, th I think senior scientists and assistant and junior associate scientists do awesome work here. I'm excited for us to get more promotion. You know, if you don't have a scientist on your team, you should be wondering why. <laughs> But I do, I, and I don't say this just because I'm up here. I do want to say thank you to Dee McKenzie because there's lots of excited rumbling around the non-tenure track about, you know, things to come. I think it's it's over over time. We're working to look at um, all our faculty positions and reevaluating um, these faculty positions. So more to come on that very soon. But uh, this is a, a, a great a great first step in recognizing uh, the accomplishments of our senior scientists who really are incredible uh, individuals and are, are contributing to the science and the practice of public health. And it's um, important that we recognize that in a very meaningful way. Any, any other questions before? I don't think there are any in line. Um, there is one. There is one, okay. From... Um, is there somebody who has their hand up? They Julia can... Wang. Julia Wang? Yeah. Julia Wang, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Thank you. 
Oh, Billy is one of my MSPH students. Oh, okay. So for Casa, can I use the uh, microphone? Is that yes. <laughs> For Casa Zulma, do you see any intersectionality or double or triple jeopardy effect for being transgender gender, female or being homeless that makes working with this population, sorry, it's a little bit long, harder? Uh, uh, pardon me. Harder than other homeless populations. So, so the first thing with working with any new population or any vulnerable population is remember they're human. That, you know, we can't understand all the circumstances that led them to their current circumstances. We shouldn't judge them. Okay. We're, we can't be in their shoes. I will say um, working with trans women has, has really given me like a re-excitement for public health, because again, I, I, you know, I need to make sure that I'm up to the latest interventions, the latest, you know, research, the latest, you know, terminology. And I want to make sure that, you know, I come, a, I've come across as I have with the other populations I've worked with as an ally and not, you know, somewhere in this Ivy tower. So I, th I think, I think there are some challenges um, the, the triple threat or the triple jeopardy, as you say, I think that would be the case for um, most populations as far as, you know, their levels of addiction, violence, poverty. Um, yeah, so I, I would say I wouldn't think trans women necessarily have, I don't know, this, this extra complication, but there's a lot that we need to work with them on and make sure that, you know, we're providing um, appropriate interventions, interventions and services for. Thanks, Julia. Thank you. We all have a last word here. Well, um, this is actually a had some, you know, issues. I mean, high school. Um, I, I mean, I guess I would just say, you know, thank you for like, you know, planting the seed of, of HIV and making me realize like there are different opportunities that people like her, you know, she was just a high school student. She wasn't anybody, you know, anybody special except her family. Um, but, you know, there's something that each of us can do whether it's getting trained in overdose, you know, getting our own HIV test or getting, you know, our own, you know, health screenings, we all can do something. So I'd say thank you for, you know, helping me realize that. Well, let me, let me, um, first of all, congratulate you on your um, promotion to senior scientist and thank you for all the great work you're doing. I will say that there has been a lot of talk um, uh, very recently at the school about our need to um, lift up uh, implementation science and implementation research here at the school. Um, there are lots of lots of good people doing implementation research and we have pockets, yep, and you are one of them. <laughs> um, but we feel that there's a need to pull that together a little bit more. Um, so we're gonna be tapping into all your expertise um, in the near future and think about an initiative in implementation research. Uh, so I hope you'll you'll be willing to work with us on thinking that through. Definitely, and I'm sure I know the people that keep bothering you about it. Yeah. <laughs> well, with that, <laughs> I want to thank everybody for coming and everybody online. And unfortunately, you know, we we do have a reception out by the Wall of Wonder um, with your colleagues and your family. And and uh, again, it's it's so great to see your family here. 
Um, unfortunately, those of you online can't join us for the reception, um, but uh, please um, drink a toast to Melissa in your own private way, and we'll see you. Um, we'll see you again soon. Thanks for joining, everybody.